So the first uh, presentation, as the medical panelists are coming up to the to the uh, board here, um, is a topic: etiology, inherited genetics, and diagnosis and staging, by Dr. Jung. She is uh, at the University of Illinois Chicago. Well, I want to thank all of you. Um, the organizers, Debbie, who I met for the first time today, very inspiring. Um, my colleagues who are here, the patients and especially the caregivers. Um, I was really wrapped with the last presentation. It's very moving. Um, even for us who deal with this every day on this other side, but to just see the whole um, 360, what it involves, what we still need to do to help. So thank you for letting me participate in this. Um, I go right into the talk, correct? Sure. This is the okay, here. so I turn forward. this way. Okay. So when I try to work on the slides for today, um, some of it is fairly scientific, but I'm going to try to explain it best I can. Um, uh, some information may be more than you um, have heard before, but that's kind of the that's kind of the gist. We want to push a little bit so everybody's informed and can make informed decisions. Um, I was charged to talk a little bit about how does this cancer form, um, how do we diagnose it, and go a little bit into staging, which will then inform some of the uh, later talks. So when we keep talking about gastric cancer, it's important to remember that not all gastric cancers are alike. The vast, vast majority is what we call adenocarcinoma. And there's some very interesting things coming uh, scientifically on where these cancers form, and we've heard a little bit about that from the panel already. Traditionally, those were all located in the body of the stomach, but now we've heard a lot about GE junction cancers, and GE junction is really where the stomach and the esophagus meet. Um, it's important because uh, there's different type of symptoms associated with it, and there's also some thought that these may dif be different types of cancers and that they're caused by different things. Um, we've also heard uh, of intestinal versus diffuse. Diffuse was the one that Missy described that she had. Intestinal is the one where the stomach lining changes from a stomach lining to an intestinal lining, and that's a precursor, and that's important because when we do the biopsies and we see some of that intestinal lining, we know that it's a precancerous lesion. So a lot of these things are important to understand, to understand where is this coming from and how do we need to react. There's also other tumors of the stomach that are not carcinoma. So that could be lymphoma. It's not as common, but it's important because there can be antibiotic treatment that can actually help. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the bacteria that have been implicated in gastric cancer. Um, much rarer is something called a carcinoid tumor. And then there's stromal tumors, which is really more from the muscle cells uh, that can become quite large and also have a different type of treatment. And uh, lastly, um, and that's especially important, we had some discussions about family history and finding out your family history. There could be tumors of the stomach that did not originate in the, in the stomach itself. And that's important to know when you've had a relative who's had uh, proposedly uh, stomach cancer, was it really a cancer that came from the stomach? It could have been a metabolic metastases. So we heard a lot about this already, uh, partially from Debbie. I'm just going to summarize a little bit. Um, it is still a very high uh, cause of death, as we've heard today. Um, we have some new evidence now. It's linked to some uh, inflammation in the stomach, most notably by a bug called H. pylori that I'll talk a little bit more later. Um, luckily, the overall incidence um, in the US has been actually um, getting much, much lower for the stomach um, type. Uh, um, however, there's a rise in GE junction cancers that we do not quite understand yet. Uh, we still have a poor prognosis. A lot of it has to do that we don't find it early enough. Norm talked about that. Uh, it's very common to have very uh, uh, unclear symptoms. You go from doctor to doctor. It's maybe stress. Um, that's what Jimmy said, you know. Um, and, and then by the time the diagnosis is actually made, it has already spread. Um, there is some genetic conditions. I'll talk more about that because that's my specialty. Um, there's very few truly uh, familial genetic uh, gastric cancer syndromes. There's one we know about. There may be more out there, but there's a lot of genetic factors that may play a role. 
So um, as Debbie alluded to too, this is really an international disease. And this is a map portraying what is the overall death rate if you adjust it for age overall. And you can see while the US is in kind of a, a light gray, um, there's other parts of the world that are much, much higher affected, Russia and China and Japan most notably. A lot may have to do with the infection with the H. pylori. We're still trying to figure it out. Is it other environmental factors? Are there genetics involved as well? This is a lot of topic for research. Again, things that we need to learn, and we need to learn internationally what's going on so we can apply it to our patients here as well or to everybody in the room because we're all a part of this international makeup. So what is going on in the US? As I already alluded to, there isn't decline, luckily, in the incidence of the general gastric cancer. Um, it is now the eighth leading cause of cancer death. Um, it is becoming more of a disease of older patients. However, as we've heard today, some very young patients are affected. So there's two things going on at the same time. Uh, we see less of the typical um, uh, body of the, of the stomach cancer, but we're seeing much more of the G-junction uh, cancers. And then we still, unfortunately, find it late. Um, I think that's something really that this organization is also pushing, is tr what can we do to find these cancers early so we have a chance to really attacking it early and curing it early. So what are some of the risk factors? So we get asked that all the time. You might have a friend who's had the gastric cancer or even a relative. What are risk factors? What makes you more likely to develop gastric cancer? And as you can tell just from seeing that list, it's a lot of things, and that typically means we don't really fully know. Um, some things that we know may affect it, but may affect just means that there's some association. It doesn't mean everybody who has this condition will develop gastric cancer. And in fact, very few people will. But H. pylori, again, I'm mentioning, so that is an important factor. Uh, something called autoimmune gastritis, so any type of inflammation of the stomach. Um, could be if you've had gastric surgery for other reasons, or something we call atrophic gastritis, where the lining has changed so it doesn't secrete acid anymore. So all these conditions have lower acid in the stomach, and the thought is maybe there's more bacteria then, and that those bacteria then contribute to the uh, gastric cancer forming. It could also be just changes that are due to maybe inflammation or something else where the stomach lining is um, basically forced to proliferate more, to grow more. Um, it could be in form of a polyp, like an adenoma that's a precancerous. It could be that it changes into a different type of lining, like more like an intestinal type lining. Um, it could be Barrett's. We talked about G-junction cancers from the stomach, but there's also some that come from the esophagus and grow downwards. So Barrett's is, can be a precursor of esophageal cancer um, that's associated with acid exposure in the esophagus. And then genetic risk factors. I talked about gastric cancer families. That is very rare, but very striking. There are certain genes that can get passed on that really have a very high risk of gastric cancer itself. Luckily, that is very rare, but it's important for us to learn about this because these genes might be modified by other genes and might be much more common in the general population that we even know of. There's other can uh, uh, cancer syndromes that may not primarily affect um, the stomach, most notably FAP that affects colon cancer or Lynch syndrome, but it also has a higher risk of gastric cancer. Um, the, the gastric cancer syndrome I talked about, I'll, I'll allude to more later, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, the gene is called CDH1. Um, and there are other ones that we're looking at more, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the genetic analysis that's being done right now, where we find that a combination of different genes that may be doing something completely different can actually affect gastric cancer risk. So how does this present? And I think we've heard from the panel that uh, very, very often early on, there really are very little symptoms. Or the symptoms are very vague. Who hasn't woken up in the morning and not felt an appetite? Who hasn't had a little bit of a twinge in the stomach? And that's a very, very common symptom. So how do you pick up when do you have to do an endoscopy, especially if it's a young person? Um, however, the elderly are mostly affected. Um, and it is a vague symptom. So um, and. If it's a symptom that's new, typically people said, I've never had any issue, and all of a sudden I'm having a hard time swallowing. Like Missy said, over time, she then developed this hard time swallowing, and that's when her doctor said, there's something wrong, let's look at this more carefully. So if something's changing, if you start losing weight, um, if you really don't feel like eating, um, again, all these things are very vague, it's putting everything into context. Um, 
uh, Jimmy said a stomach ulcer. So ulcers are still not rare. Um, it is very important that when there was an ulcer, we always have to go back six weeks later and we check for healing as an endoscopist because many cancers can look like an ulcer. And they can look like an ulcer that's just caused by, caused by acid, and that should usually just heal. Some people um, present with vomiting because uh, there's a blockage and uh, the food can pass through. Uh, there could be anemia because of loss of blood from the cancer. Or there could be signs from the cancer already having spread with having lymph nodes or metastasized. So again, it's a very vague set of symptoms. Many times we hear, oh, by hindsight, those symptoms started a lot earlier. And then there's always a thought, could we have done something earlier? Could somebody have picked this up before? Um, I would say many, many times, because I see many patients with very vague, vague abdominal symptoms, and many times we do endoscopies, and the vast, vast, vast majority, we don't find anything. But of course, it's for the few people that we do find it that we want to be very vigilant. So I would say it's just putting everything together. If something doesn't go away, be persistent. Um, if you feel it's a change, and if there's what we call warning signs, like weight loss, real change outside of what you're used to, um, it's something to raise awareness. So how do we diagnose? And um, for now, the, the, the most uh, common way of diagnosing still, and I think most of the panelists refer to that too, is an upper GI endoscopy. So that's when you go down with a uh, scope into the stomach, you can look at the lining, and at the same time, if you see something that looks suspicious, you can take biopsies, and that then gets analyzed under the microscope. Um, that will allow to make the diagnosis and also give some information about the type of the cancer. Is it the diffuse type or is it the intestinal type? Um, that doesn't tell you much about how far it has spread. That's just the initial diagnosis. And from what the panel said, um, once the diagnosis is made, then more workup is being done to get more information on how deep it has spread. Um, especially in the past, there were ways to do a barium swallow where uh, contrast material is being swallowed and then an x-ray is taken to look at the outline of the stomach. Um, and that can give you an idea that there's a cancer. However, however, there's a problem that many times it may not pick up a small cancer. And sometimes people, like I think Missy mentioned, she was getting a CT for a different reason, and that's how it was found. So sometimes that's incidental. Something's found on CT for some other reason, and then we go in and look specifically. So there's multiple ways um, that this can be diagnosed. Um, I think uh, other speakers will talk a little bit more about specifically what treatment is being done for what stage. Um, uh, and it's fairly complicated even for healthcare professionals, but T and M staging is the typical staging that's being used. T is tumor, N is nodes, lymph nodes, M is metastases. Each one gets a number, and that number together informs the stage. And the stage usually informs what kind of treatment is being offered. The most important thing we could give a whole hour just on this. The most important thing to remember on this is, is this what is called local regional, which meaning confined to the stomach and around it, or is it systemic? This is the information that really we're trying to garner when we get all that information. And what information are we getting? So typically, um, for sure, there's an abdomen and pelvis CT scan to see other lymph nodes is there um, meds to the peritoneum, as Missy had mentioned, so where there's some seepage into the abdominal cavity. Um, also, usually the, the lungs are being looked at for metastases. That could be an x-ray in old times. Most of the time now we do a CT of the chest. Um, to look for liver meds, usually it's the CT of the abdomen, but you could use an ultrasound. Um, many times we go back in with an ultrasound probe um, to look at the stomach lining to see how deep this tumor is, because that tells us how many layers are involved and how far deep it has gone and whether there are also lymph nodes, and most importantly, whether it affects adjoining vessels, because that again tells us if there's a surgery, how extensive should that surgery be? Is it something where the surgery is likely to be successful to remove the whole tumor? Um, and then finally, there's PET scanning, where uh, the metabolic activity of metastases is being used to pick up whether anything else has spread. So how can these look like? Um, many times, it really looks like an ulcer or a polyp. And uh, then we take biopsies from this, and then we look at it under the microscope. So this is how it can look like under the microscope. So I just brought two examples. One is the intestinal type. Um, even for the non-physician, you, uh, you can see that it looks a lot more organized. It kind of forms these glands. Um, it's, it's still growing in an organized fashion versus the diffuse type. You see it's cells all over that are kind of invaded each other. So um, this is how, how this would look like. 
Um, these are some older pictures from how an upper GI series would look like. So you see on the left, uh, the, with the pyloric uh, obstruction on the left side, this is somebody who may present with uh, early satiety. They can eat, they have, to, they have nausea and vomiting, because where the little arrow shows, that's a narrowing. That's where it should be wide open, where the stomach empties into the small intestine, and it's narrowed because the tumor is sitting right there. Um, the arrow on the right shows you an indentation, which is basically, if you look at the black around it, that would be the tumor. So the tumor is grown and it has a local ulcer in the middle. This is something that could actually look like an ulcer on endoscopy. Now, endoscopic ultrasound is a fairly new uh, technique that we now use. Um, it, is, it is a little bit difficult to fully understand for physicians, too. If you see on the bottom, you have the scope. So this is a radial scope. So it's a probe you go down into the stomach. Um, the scope abuts the lining, as you can see on the top. And whatever is dark up there or uh, red and below is the mass. And you can basically see the outlining of this mass. And where it says invasion, it tells you how far it's gone. Because that invasive border is basically where the end of the outside of the stomach is. So that gives you a good idea of where the stomach, how far it has grown. So how does this form? So there are many, many theories. Again, we could do a whole hour on this. But as of today, Yes, as of today, I'm giving the five minutes, so not an hour on this one, right? Um, as of today, uh, there's a couple of things that can lead to this. One is uh, we feel like certain types of eating, there's some, some thought that cured meat salt can lead to some gastritis, H. pylori again, and then that this gastritis can lead to the lining to get thinner, um, the thinner lining to change into a different lining, that then becoming busy as we call dysplasia, and we can see that under the microscope, and then leading to cancer. So what about inflammation and cancer? So we even have a Times uh, article on this, and I'm not gonna go over all of those, but there's many, many conditions where there's first a lot of inflammation and then there's cancer. What about H. pylori? So I mentioned this a bunch of times now, and it's important to um, understand how this forms. So many of us, uh, and especially in uh, countries where there's not as good refrigeration, or where food doesn't get cooked all the way through, um, we have H. pylori. And so H. pylori resides in the stomach. In early adulthood, there might be some gastritis we may not even know about. And if you look at the number, 90% of people with H. pylori don't even feel a thing. You could have ulcers from it, but 0.5%, there may be a gastric cancer associated with it. Now, the other way around, many gastric cancer patients have H. pylori. So how does H. pylori do it? We don't really fully understand. There might be two different effects that we're thinking about. One is indirect via the immune system itself that then makes the cancer be promoted from a local cancer to a bigger cancer versus the direct effects where actually the cancer just gets started because of the effects of the bacterium. I want to just briefly talk about the genetic as, uh, assessments, and there's two different types. I know at the very end we're going to talk of the genome of the stomach, so I don't want to really fu fully steal your thumb thunder, but this was done by Ed Adam Bass, who I believe is also here, uh, one of the, uh, the members of, the, of Debbie's foundation I saw. So what, what he did is like grind up all kinds of different stomachs and look at what are the genetic mutations in these stomachs. Now, this is not something that's being passed on through generations. This is the actual stomach and what's the genetics of that tumor, um, and can we group them and understand better what the treatment is. And what he found is that there were four different types of stomach cancers, genetically speaking. And he also located where are they located and do they look differently. And this is really the stuff that's going to be the wave of the future that we understand how is that tumor genetically made up, what are they likely, what treatment are they likely to respond to, what treatment should they get, what is higher risk and what is lower risk. And in interest of time, I'm just going to briefly mention um, two of them have different mechanisms of how they form mutations. One is chromosomal unstable, where chromosomes break off and activate certain genes. The other one is microsatellite unstable, where there's lots of small mutations affecting genes. One seemed to be associated with a virus called Epstein-Barr, and then the other one is genomically stable. So um, this is in the early infancy, but we've gotten a lot of information that we have to sift through, and it really helps the oncologist inform what chemo should a person have, what treatment should they have, what surveillance should they have. So this is really to stay tuned. 
Lastly, I'm going to talk about the hereditary form. As I mentioned, this is very, very rare, but it's very interesting for us to understand how these tumors formed. This was reported in 1998. It is an autosomal dominant. That means it is passed on through either the father or the mother. Most people who have this gene, and that's what it's called highly penetrant, will develop this type of cancer. It's a signet ring cell or diffuse type, and uh, people with the gene without even having the cancer many times are advised to have a gastrectomy. We need to find better therapies to prevent or delay these cancers. So in summary, gastric cancer still remains very lethal, as usually the symptoms develop too late for a full cure, Early endoscopy with biopsy can diagnose cancers. In the US, gastric cancer risk factors are likely a combination of genetics and environmental factors. We know about the involvement of H. pylori. It is very common, but only a few patients with H. pylori develop gastric cancer. So what do we do and who do we treat? Familial gastric cancer is rare, but it's very serious. And we still need to learn much, much more how to better diagnose and prevent gastric cancer. And with this, I will end. I want to acknowledge all my patients, all my collaborators, um, the faculty I work with, and Dr. Tim Wang, who shared some of the slides with me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jung. Thank you for that excellent overview on the causes, the distribution geographically, and um, all of the other things that you discussed. Are there any questions right off the bat? I do have one that I'll read off the WebEx um, while you're getting that one. Um, are there any targeted therapy or treatments for those mutations? And we, as you mentioned, we'll be talking about this specifically uh, along the way. Um, and maybe this can lead into another question about when you're diagnosing another critical thing that we look for, especially in the stage four, is um, the HER2 status. So maybe we, we can all contribute to that uh, discussion here. So I think there's, there's two ways to look at, well, actually three ways. But one is um, when we look at the overall genetics, I think we're really moving away from single mutations, more like how is this whole tumor behaving. So we're looking not as much as one gene and one treatment, but more do we understand how this whole tumor is behaving and which group it is. So that to the targeted gene mutation. So we're finding out more and more it's not one gene, one tumor. Now, there are certain genes that we're going to hear about more later um, that inform what would be a good treatment for that tumor, most likely because they're a marker for what that cancer does. Does that answer? Very good. Um, and to follow up on that, uh, a question is, when should testing for any of these mutations, particularly for HER2, occur? So that would be part of the staging workup and in discussion with your oncologist. Most of those really at the time of staging when the biopsy is taken involve those stains to help with treatment decisions. Okay. So um, maybe we can open it up to the panel and Dr. Benson specifically who's going to be speaking next about guidelines and, and what we do. So could, do we want to comment on when uh, we do the HER2 testing. Do we wait to see what the stage is first before we do it, or do we do it on everybody um, when they get diagnosed? So uh, some institutions now are doing genomic profiles on, on all patients' tumors. But in terms of HER2 expression at this point in time, that is most relevant for people who have metastatic or stage four disease. And there have been randomized clinical trials that show that for this population, which is roughly about 20% of gastric cancer patients who have HER2 expression, there is benefit with the addition of the targeted therapy trastuzumab, which was originally developed in, in breast cancer. And this is an example how there are some uh, genetic changes that cross diseases. So we can see HER2 expression in breast cancer, colon cancer, gastric cancer. However, and I think uh, Barbara's point is, is important that uh, a single genetic change may not be sufficient. So where we see that trastuzumab can be beneficial for HER2 patients with metastatic gastric cancer and breast cancer, it's really unclear in colon cancer how uh, relative that is. 
Um, what we hope is more and more patients are having genomic profiling uh, performed on their tumors, we will identify uh, other uh, mutations or clusters of mutations for which we can develop targeted therapies. And so this is one of the uh, most important areas of research. Many of us, uh, certainly the big cancer centers, uh, have developmental therapeutics programs where we're, we're taking individual patient tumors and performing genomic analyses and seeing if we have, for example, a clinical trial that matches that. Uh, unfortunately, we realize that one mutation alone is not going to be sufficient, and one of our greatest challenges is how do we identify those mutations, for example, that are most important, and perhaps that will lead to sequential therapies over time that will have the greatest uh, impact. Great. Um, also going to some of the other things that were mentioned, the, the imaging that's done, a common question we have is, do we need a PET scan? And, and, and Dr. Jung mentioned you could consider a PET scan. When do you do it? When do you consider adding that in? Do you do it on all patients when they're getting diagnosed? Does it matter if they're stomach cancer or G junction cancer? Does it, do you have some other information before you get it, or do you just do it on all patients? And I guess we could ask Dr. Benson. Uh, generally, uh, first of all, I, I have to comment. Uh, that PET scanning is way, way, way overutilized. Um, I agree. And uh, it exposes people to unnecessary radiation, for example. Uh, it's very expensive and often not useful. However, uh, we do consider PET scanning, um, particularly in situations where surgery is being considered or if there are suspicious areas, say, on a CT scan and you're thinking about surgery and you want to see if uh, on a PET scan uh, some of these other spots may, uh, may be uh, visualized on the PET scan, which could lead to pre-surgical interventions, such as getting uh, a biopsy of a suspicious area or, uh, in many cases, uh, before a surgical resection, considering a laparoscopic uh, evaluation. I'm sure Dr. Posner is going to talk about that. But um, there are situations where a PET scan can be useful, but it, it should not be routinely used to follow how patients are doing under treatment and should be selectively used uh, overall. Okay. Are there any questions about causes, um, family risk? or diagnostic uh, questions in terms of getting a stage and diagnosis and why we do that? Sure, Jimmy. So my question for Dr. Jung, um, so I have three boys and I obviously developed, you know, gastric cancer at an early age. What should I do to make sure my three sons are aware of uh, if they have H. pylori or gastric cancer symptoms? So that's actually the big, the majority of my patients are not the ones who are concerned about themselves. It's really they're concerned about their children. And so what I would advise you is find somebody who does this and unless you've already met with them and really look at the whole family risk. What other cancers were in the, in the family? The fact that you had it so early makes one worried that there is a genetic part. Now, as I mentioned, there's only one genetic syndrome that we know about that would be easy to find out if you have that or not. Uh, the problem is if you don't have that, because you still have some kind of genetic syndrome or some genetics that happen because it's so early, but we wouldn't know what that is. So that, that is the most difficult conundrum where I have to say, Clearly something's going on, there's some environmental component, but I'm sure there's some genetic con con component, but I don't know what that is. And that's basically when a plan is developed 
of when to maybe check the children, although there's no data for this right now. That's where you're going to end up in an area where there's no guidelines, no data, what to do about H. pylori. What I typically do in patients who have a higher risk because they have another syndrome, I always check for H. pylori and I give the antibiotics to um, treat it, uh, although it wouldn't be otherwise indicated. But in somebody with a higher risk of gastric cancer, I always treat that, so at least they have that, that risk eliminated. Can you expand? We, we've talked a little bit about tumor sequencing and, and looking at higher numbers of genes all at the same time, Dr. Benson mentioned, and I'm going to be talking specifically about that at the, in the last lecture. Um, can you tell us about some of the things that we find by accident by doing that sequencing that may imply that it was an inherited uh, problem that we weren't suspecting or that we didn't really right. detect it went under the radar there wasn't a strong family history but then we get a mutation back that's highly suggestive that it could be from a familial thing how do we deal with that and tell our patients so there's two ways of looking of genetics. So one genetic is to look at the tumor, because by definition, the fact that the tumor can grow as much as it grows means that there's genetic mutations. But those mutations many times just develop in that tissue. Then there's the genetic syndromes where every cell of the body has that mutation and it gets passed on. So there's two different ways of detecting those. The tumor genetics typically takes tumor cells and looks at what the changes are. The genetics where we look at what is being passed on typically takes normal blood cells and looks. So any genetic analysis, especially now as we have very powerful techniques to look for hundreds and hundreds of mutations, has the risk or the benefit, depending on how you look at it, to pick up things that we did not expect. So one of the things that always before we do a genetic analysis, especially if we do a blood genetic analysis, um, there has to be a counseling and there has to be a consent. And one of the things that we consent for is we may pick up things that we didn't, weren't looking for. What would you like us to do in that instance? So one example is, for instance, that I have somebody who has a colon cancer risk and we run a whole panel of genes and it picks up a breast cancer gene. So, you know, and those, those things happen. And then we go back and we tell them, well, we didn't find the colon cancer gene. That doesn't mean you don't have a higher risk of colon cancer. I know you do because you've had it and your family has it. But on top of it, we found this other gene. So they're, they're ethic, the, the tricky ethical dilemmas that can arise, it's very important that there's clear communication and it's very important that there's, that there's informed consent. Now, the tumor genetics is a little bit different. That can also happen. You could look at a certain panel, so one of those four groups that were found hint at a more genetic type. So what would then happen is that we would find those mutations in the tumor that look like it could be a genetic tumor, and then you would probably go back and assess the family, uh, look at the whole family history again, although some family histories um, don't don't go with that. Sometimes it's just one young person diagnosed, and maybe the family history is not known, or somebody is adopted, or it just wasn't really reported well what was going on with previous generations. So in that case, one can go back and say, we think there might be a reason to do a blood test. The blood test, we would look for this. This is what this would entail. So a lot of it is based on communication. It's very important that all parties clearly understand what's being looked at and what is the potential outcome. What are we looking to find and what are we going to do when we find this? One biggest thing that I see is when we do genetic testing, let's say we tested you and we didn't find that gene. The biggest mistake is to say, oh, he doesn't have a risk for gastric cancer. That's not true. It's only that the one gene that I know about, I did not find in you. So it doesn't change the risk. You've shown me you have the risk. So that's a very important thing. That's why it really should be in the hands of uh, specialized centers and people who deal with this so they can clearly give you a good answer of what this means and put it into context. And even if the answer is, which it now still be, many times we don't really know what to do with this, but stay tuned. A quick follow, okay, yes? Uh, I just have a quick question and I, I apologize if it's redundant. Um, but if you have been, for instance, in my case, I have, hered I, I have diffuse gastric cancer. I have, have had extensive genetic testing, and I do not carry any known inherited mutations, which is great. But those are known mutations. So for my children, as, as, as we've all talked about, what, they're, they're, they're still at a higher risk probably for a gastric cancer just because they've had a parent who's had it. 
What would you suggest for somebody as, as they grow older, you know, like a baseline kind of thing? Because we don't do a lot of baseline testing in this country. We don't do baseline endoscopies. We do colonoscopies. Um, so do you have any suggestions for people that, that, that currently don't have a known mutation, but doesn't mean there isn't one, and you, we just don't know about it, and what you would do with their, their um, you know, offspring? It is very, very tricky, and I deal with this all the time, because no guideline will suggest doing anything specific. Yet it's very difficult as a parent, as a sibling, as a spouse, to sit there and quote unquote feel like you do nothing. So. And then you have to qualify it to do nothing because sometimes in medicine, and, and Dr. Benson just alluded to that, not doing something is actually the right thing to do. So I would say find somebody you really, really trust who knows the subject and have an intense dialogue and come up with a mutually agreeable plan because it is a gray zone. There's nobody that's going to be able to tell you this is absolutely the right thing to do. But it has to be something, what I always try to do is work with my patients and see, because everybody has very different preferences. Some people do not want to undergo ongoing screening or surveillance, for instance, for colonoscopies. They say, I'd rather wait because I really hate that test. I really don't want to do it. And then I have others, eight months into it, they wake up every night, they worry about the colonoscopy, they wish it was earlier. So I try to work with the, 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 the patient and the family, for that matter, what works best for them. And it's a little bit of a gray zone because there's no good guidance, because these are such individualized cases and we don't know enough about it. And the same implication, then you say, you know, you're worried about your children, how is it for the children if they have to undergo this, right? What does that tell them? So that's why genetic testing can be very helpful if one has this mutation, because what would happen if you had the mutation, you could do a blood test on the children, and if they didn't have it, they would be off the hook. So that's what we really try to do for the ones that we know more we have more information for other syndromes. More research is needed. Maybe we can find more of those mutations that identify who has it and who doesn't have.